Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Living the Life. Nasheed artist Ahmed Hussain is still with us and he's going to be performing for us a little bit later on. Indeed. Now, our second guest of the evening is a controversial jazz musician who describes himself as a Hebrew speaking Palestinian. This is Israeli born, uh, this is Israeli born Gilad. Atzmon. He's made a name for himself, not just with his writings on the Middle East affairs, but also in the world of jazz music. Well, Sabar Bhatti has been getting to know the man behind the saxophone, whose lungs are just as powerful as the pen with which he writes. <laughs> Somewhere along the late 70s, jazz music moved away from being mainstream and was relabeled by one famous musician as social music. It was said that jazz became controversial as this very American style of music underwent a series of avant-garde changes. So Israeli-born Gilad Atzmon fits right into the global jazz scene, where his music refrains from controversy, his views on politics has everyone talking. The internationally renowned composer has become as well known for his controversial written attacks on his birthplace and former homeland as he has for his virtuoso saxophone skills. And the tune that we are going to play to you now is, uh, is our, uh, is our tu tribute to our brothers and sisters in Gaza. They gave the Israeli a good fight and bless them. And inshallah, they win very soon. As he joins us tonight on Living the Life, Gilad Atzmon is embarking on the latest leg of a world tour to promote his new album, Songs of the Metropolis. For this, he's teamed up with the Orient House Ensemble, and over the weekend, the musician expressed his support for the people of Gaza, while calling on Israel to permanently end conflict in the region. If Israel wants to settle, to fulfill the Zionist dream, to become civilized Jews, all they have to do is to say, we stop. We understand. This, la this land belongs to two people. We welcome the Palestinians to come back. Once himself an Israeli soldier and having fought in the first Israeli war on Lebanon, Gilad is skeptical about rumors that the current war on Gaza is winding down. Drawing on Arabic music for inspiration, Gilad says his style of playing changed when he learned how to channel anger into his work, something he believes the majority of jazz musicians fail to do. Jazz music has become too, what we call in England, muso-ish. It's very muso, very intellectual, very clever, very dry and very boring. I think that music should have passion in it. It should express anger. The 51-year-old musician who lives in London became a British citizen in 2002, having renounced his Israeli citizenship. Regularly playing more than 100 shows a year, both with the Orient House Ensemble and the long-standing British rock band The Blockheads, Gilad Atzmon has been called the hardest gigging man in British jazz. He's also recorded and performed with the likes of Sir Paul McCartney and Robbie Williams. So, wow. Gilad Atzman, the gentleman we just saw in that story, is our next guest. He's the author of the book here, The Wandering Who, A Study of Jewish Identity Politics. Good evening, Gilad. Oh. Thank you very much for joining us uh, Welcome, today sir. on the show. Welcome. Now, that's a fascinating combination. You don't, I don't, I, I'm going to guess here, but I don't think many people who play the saxophone are... are, are necessarily overlap with people who write about identity-based literature. I mean, can you, can you tell um, us about how that crossover happened? I don't really know how it happened. I guess that I didn't, I didn't write as a youngster and uh, I never thought that uh, I'm destined to become a writer. I think that when I was 24, I had uh, mm. my first um, computer. IBM kind of 286, uh -huh. it was very early. And I was fascinated by this machine. First, I tried to produce music with it. And uh, 
And I think that at a certain stage, I realized that I can also write on it. That's pretty. <laughs> and you've become really well known for your political I mean, talking views. about your writing, yeah. your, your views are, are very strong and they're very personal to you. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is uh, true. Uh, unlike most commentators mm. on issues to do with uh, Jewish politics or Jewish identity or identity in general, I have never been uh, affiliated uh, with any political party and never been a, a member of any political party. I'm doing it because it is fascinating for me. It's a fascinating subject. I'm dealing uh, with Jews and they are quite uh, uh, fascinating people when they don't engage in uh, little wars. Um, and um, it kept me very, very, interest very interested. I, I thought that by now I would be able to drift away and to look into other stuff, but uh, um, every day uh, I find uh, something interesting to, to, to investigate, and I write a lot, I write a lot. So can I ask you, right, <coughs> you used to be an Israeli soldier, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and you've gone from being an Israeli soldier to doing a complete U-turn and moving, uh, you know, and almost pretty much outwardly criticizing the, what's happening and supporting totally. the Palestinians. I mean, you uh, totally. the front I, I, line, I, I, the I, front I, line, basically. Uh, uh, I, uh, not only that I criticize uh, Israel, I criticize the entire issue of uh, Jewish politics, Jewish identity politics, not Judaism. Mm -hmm. I don't have problem problem with Judaism and I don't necessarily have problem with Jews as people. But I do have a problem uh, with uh, uh, Jewish identity politics. I uh, argue that uh, it is a very exclusive, uh, to a certain extent, uh, supremacist uh, identity. Uh, and I'm uh, very critical of it. Until now, uh, I, I managed to annoy quite a lot of people, but as far as I'm aware, um, not a single person uh, managed to find a mistake I mean, in my book. On, on that note, I mean, it's very easy when, when any side criticizes the other side, it's very easy to make it sound as Islamophobic or anti-Semitic, yeah. etc. But you found a different avenue, other than just writing, is your music. As you mentioned in the video, you, you channel your anger and your frustration through music as well. It's quite um, clever how you've managed to do that. Um, uh, from, uh, you see, most people have a day job. Mm. They, uh, they uh, wake up in the morning and they work between 9 to 5 and then they're pretty much exhausted and uh, they go to sleep. Uh, my job, your job, you know, we really, when we work, and I pre basically perform pretty much every night, it's two hours. Mm. A lot of time to kill. Uh, and I'm touring a lot. I like to read. And every time I read something, I want to write what I think about it. So this is, this is, this is the way it works for, it works for me. And, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, um, the issue with Jewish identity politics was very, has been very fascinating for me for more than a while because uh, it allowed me to look into myself into it's it's a it's a form of mirroring, you know. It saved me a lot of money. I don't have to mm. go to a psychoanalyst. Absolutely, Absolutely. and <laughs> I don't you, need a shrink. You, you, most certainly. And you've also been very sympathetic about what's happening, uh, you know, with, with the Gazan people and you it's, know, it's the loss of life there. What do you what do you feel about what's happening? I, I feel I feel that uh, it is uh, totally devastating uh, to see the level of brutality. Uh, that uh, is uh, manifested uh, by the Israeli operation. We know the numbers, but again, I wasn't surprised by it. I wrote a book about it. Mm -hmm. I can see the continuation between the Old Testament uh, uh, vile uh, barbarism mm. and uh, the Israeli state, and uh, and I argue that uh, um, the interpretation that mm. the Israelis and to a certain extent the Zionist movement uh, have been giving to, to, the, to the Jewish religious text is indeed uh, very, course, very dangerous. Indeed. Let's stay with yeah. us and of course we, we're all
praying for praying the for situation Gaza. in Gaza and things that come to a peace. Yeah. We're going to stay with Gaza for the moment. Its residents have spent more than three weeks under the constant threat of Israeli bombardment. It's turned everyday life in Gaza into a desperate struggle for survival. That struggle has become even more difficult in the last few days after Israeli tanks destroyed the region's only power plant. Sadia Chaudhary brings us this story. Power was already scarce in this part of the world where people are used to living half the day without any electricity. It's because years of Israeli bombings have left Gaza's only power plant always in need of repair. Every time the plant is rebuilt, another war on Gaza renders it useless. Today, 80% of Gaza's residents are without power. Compounding this problem is a looming fuel crisis. Gaza has suffered from a crippling fuel shortage for much of the last two years, and the lack of electricity means that most of the available gas and diesel is being used to power generators. Due to continuous conflict, we can't get enough fuel from outside. Now the whole Gaza area is facing gas and diesel shortages. Power shortages are nothing new in Gaza, with many areas receiving only a few hours of electricity each day, even before the recent conflict began. But the destruction of the power plant on July 29th ended even that limited supply. Very few vehicles can now be seen on the streets of Gaza City, all thanks to the crippling shortages. Some residents have resorted to horse-drawn carts as their only way to flee the conflict zone. So it's no wonder that many gas stations in the city have shut down. Fuel trucks lie abandoned on almost every street corner. At the few remaining pumps, residents say they often have to queue for hours just to collect a small bucket of diesel, since the gas stations themselves are relying on power generators for the pumps. Now we have to rely on our own power generator that lets us operate for only several hours a day. I've been waiting here for one and a half hours to fuel my car, and I want about three litres for my power generator to run my water pump at home. That much diesel can only support about three hours water supply, but we have to wait at the gas station for several hours just to get it. The diesel supplies may give people in Gaza enough power to survive for a brief period of time, but the Strip's residents know well that the only way their lives will ever return to any semblance of normalcy will be through a lasting ceasefire. <laughs> well, we've just seen a clip of that fantastic saxophone. Yeah, so brilliant. Tell us about it. I mean, it's a beautiful piece of equipment. Okay, it is. Um, and it's. I, I imagine it's quite expensive to get a hold of. Mm, not really. Saxophone is uh, not an expensive. Uh, but do you have, uh, do you have an instrument? But I, uh, connection with it. Uh, definitely, you know, uh, saxophonists uh, always carry their uh, instruments and look after them. Absolutely. Uh, it's like drummers that every time of they course. have to play on new drums, you know, <laughs> like, uh, so yeah, definitely. You're going to be performing for us shortly, right? Is yeah, in once, uh, once. Yeah. Uh, I think you. I think you're going to perform for us now. now I think yeah, we're going to give you the chance up and up. to go over to our next. Yeah, yes, like, yes, please. We look forward to seeing this. this is going to be very exciting. He's ready for the very first time on Living the Life. Our first jazz performance. This is Gilad Atzman. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yes. Fantastic. Come on over. Come, come, on, back, come to back to the. Over. Come back over here, sir. Welcome. Fantastic.